when I was laying out this pod, I thought, sad story, happy story, and then perhaps something in between. So, our next speaker, Ethan Brown, leads a company called Beyond Meat, and it is their aim to manufacture fake meat using patented technology and plant products to create a vegan alternative to meat. Ethan. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Honored to be here. Thank you. So thank you, everybody, for, for, uh, for being here, and, and uh, thank you for the invitation to, to speak today. I would spent a little bit of time in your beautiful city. I had never spent much time here, and, and uh, it's just such an impressive and, and wonderful place. I can tell you, you'll be seeing a lot more of me if Trump gets elected, so we'll... Uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully the, the borders will still be open and I can get across, and, uh, but I joke. Um, but so, so what my company's about is uh, not necessarily creating fake meat, but it's about taking uh, the core elements of, of meat, uh, but from plants, and assembling them in the same architecture uh, that is animal muscle or meat. And I'll walk through how we think about that and, uh, and how, how we go about it. So change. Uh, another word for that is disruption. I like to use the word change a little bit more because I think disruption is often overused. And, and what, what I'm trying to do and what our company's trying to do and our investors and our backers are trying to do is to change uh, the protein at the center of the plate. And that's really our core, our core goal. But that's hard. It's, it's, it's when you talk about change or disruption and you talk about replacing landlines, uh, for example, with mobile phones, you're talking about uh, addressing an industry that's been around uh, in evolutionary terms for you know, less than a second, right? Something that's been here as part of our industrial economy and now we're replacing it with something that's more efficient. But when you talk about changing the protein in the center of the plate, you really have to think about it in evolutionary terms and in that period. And we have been consuming meat as a species for over two million years. It's not just the decision to consume it, but it's what meat did for us. It's very hard to separate our history from the history of meat consumption. When we started eating meat, our brains were 600 cubic centimeters. They're now 1,300 today. So it contributed to the growth of our intellectual capability. It contributed to the way our bodies are. At about 1.5 million years ago, we started to consume higher levels of meat, and our brain grew. Our, 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 uh, our guts shrank, right? And the energy distribution within our bodies changed. It takes 16 times more energy to, uh, to, to, to operate your brain than it does a skeletal muscle. And so all of these changes occurred while we were eating this very nutrient-dense source of food. And at first, we were not hunters. At first, we were scavengers. So between the leopard, the lion, and the vultures that did the cleanup work, we came in. And we pulled the, the, the leftover muscle from the bone. We ate a lot of bone marrow. This, again, contributed to our physiological and intellectual growth. Uh, and then we began to hunt. And this process of hunting also aided in how we set up societies and thought about social groups and sharing, uh, et cetera. So when you talk about changing this, the protein center plate or people eating less animal meat, you have to think about it in a very long time period. If that's not hard enough, theology comes along. And theology says dominion over animals. The animals are here for you to consume. Uh, animals are part of many, many different religious rituals, the sacrifice of the lamb, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, it's not only the evolutionary context, but it's this uh, religious context which we have to think about changing the protein in the center of the plate. Lastly, it's in our culture, right? So this is, uh, I think you got Richard Sherman and, and uh, Russell Wilson there uh, after a game on American Thanksgiving uh, enjoying turkey, right? This is what we do. It's part of our culture. It's part of who we are. So the idea that we're going to come in and, and simply change out the protein at the center of the plate and disrupt an existing industry uh, is maybe a little more complex uh, than if you were to approach some other technological advance in society. But we should do it. And there really are four reasons we should do it. And I want to walk through each one of those because it's what inspired me to start the company. I began the company in 2009. And the idea was that I could take a single uh, problem, which was the animal protein at the center of the plate, and by changing that protein, I could attack four problems that I cared a tremendous amount about. So the first one, who has any idea what that statistic is, what that ratio is? Anyone want to guess? Close. Right, so three of the top 10 mortality drivers in the United States, at least, are driven by animal protein consumption, or there's a strong correlation, is maybe a safer way to say it, and that's um, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. 51%, anyone want to guess what that is? So this is a controversial number, but I want to talk a little bit about it because I think it's important to think about it. So a guy named uh, Robert Goodland was the chief environmental officer at the World Bank. 
So this is not the Sierra Club, it's not PETA, it's not left-leaning. In fact, the World Bank is often reviled in many in countries and, and left-leaning organizations, et cetera. But he said, he was a chief environmental officer, he said, I care about understanding what's actually driving climate change, what's driving the emissions that we're facing. So I'm gonna do an exhaustive study, a life cycle study, of the impact of livestock on greenhouse gas emissions. And through that process, he collected data from every, every aspect of that uh, production process. And what he found was that 51% of greenhouse gas emissions can be attributed to livestock. Now, the UN has taken issue with this number, but I've never seen a sound scientific attack on his number. They've said, well, he, he included uh, animals breathing, and, and we don't include that, but we should include animals breathing. You know, there's an unnatural number of animals on the Earth's surface. And when they breathe, they respire carbon. You have to count that. So he counts that and adds that up, and it's about 14% of his total number. Anyway, whether you believe 51% or you believe 30% or you believe 25% doesn't really matter. The point is that it is a massive contributor to climate change. Anyone want to guess what 80% is? So that's the land in the United States that one way or another is tied to producing feed uh, for animals. So a massive amount of land and energy goes into this. Why is that important? If you go to any business school worth its salt, go to the operations class, the basic operations class, they'll start talking to you about the bottleneck, right? And in our case, the bottleneck is the animal. And so agricultural universities, uh, uh, um, organizations, et cetera, all focus on how do we make it a more efficient animal? And you saw some of that in the initial uh, footage today. Um, you know, books, uh, courses, uh, institutes, et cetera, are all founded around this idea of how do we make the animal more efficient? My thought is, let's get rid of the animal. Let's not use it. Let's get the materials directly from plants. Let's turn them into a piece of meat directly. We'll talk about how we do that. But it's a different concept. It's a concept that Ford had. He said, I don't want a faster horse. I want something different. And if we're going to feed this population, we're going to need to think differently. We can't keep increasing the efficiency of the animal. Again, to get back to the example, there's, there's 66 billion animals that are slaughtered every year. Each one of those is breathing. Science is fantastic, but I highly doubt you're going to create an animal that doesn't breathe. And just by breathing, they're impacting our climate. So that's the number, 66 billion, raised and slaughtered every year. As the population grows, the demand on that, that number is going to increase more and more. We simply cannot continue to think about increasing the efficiency of the animal. We have to think about doing something different. So I want to talk a little about the things you saw earlier on uh, with the footage of the, the industrial agriculture for, for, uh, for poultry and, and, and for cattle and, uh, and for swine. With Francis Bacon, Descartes, et cetera, the notion that the animal was a machine, all of those systems made sense. Let's make the animal as efficient as we can, let's do it in large numbers. But a guy by the name of Charles Darwin came along and ruined that. He said, in fact, we're not distinctly different from an animal. The way he described it was the degrees of difference. What he meant by that was there's no sharp break between animals and humans. That in fact, we share uh, emotional and intellectual uh, boundaries. Uh, we have different aspects of ourselves, which, which some are stronger than animals, some are weaker, et cetera. But the, the notion that we somehow stand distinct from them is false. And so scientifically, you think about that, you think about we share a central nervous system, Right? We share uh, many different cognitive similarities, right? If that's the case, it's my thought that it's a tragic misunderstanding that we're taking large numbers of sentient beings and confining them in the way we are today. Something has to change. If you believe the science, now if you dismiss the science, that's another thought. Or if you ground it in, in theology, that's maybe what you want to do. But scientifically, we cannot continue to position the animal as something that is distinct from us in terms of how they experience pain, how they experience emotional bonds, uh, and their intellectual capabilities. So how do we get out of this? We love meat. We're going to continue to consume meat. I don't, there's no chance that as a, as a race we're going to stop eating meat. So how do we get out of this problem? So a lot of you have probably seen this. You've been in a management class. How many people see an old woman in this, in this sketch? How many people see a young woman? Thankfully, there are two ways to see a problem. So the way that most people see meat is through its origin. Meat has to come from a chicken, cow, or pig. If you're a hunter, it comes from, from deer, venison, et cetera. I think about it differently. I want you to think about meat in terms of its composition. 
And that's the great thing about this is meat is knowable. The composition is understandable. You can open up a textbook at land grant universities and you can understand what comprises meat. We've done this where we take a chicken breast, we put it on an MRI, and we understand the distribution of fat and protein and water within a piece of meat. In short, we can understand the architecture and the composition of meat. It's basically water, amino acids, lipids, carbohydrates, and minerals. That's it. It's not a mystery. It's not that complicated. So all the systems that you saw in place in the videos that came on uh, at the beginning of our session were simply ways of forcing a huge amount of plant matter, water, and energy into a very inefficient bioreactor, and then turning that bio and then basically producing meat from that bioreactor. Why not get rid of that inefficient bioreactor? Why not take the amino acids, lipids, carbohydrates, minerals, and water from non-animal sources and assemble them against the blueprint of meat? And that's what we're after. So this is an interesting graph here. So if you see beef in 1970, you see a decline in consumption through to today. And if you see milk over that same period, you also see a decline in consumption. The meat industry is watching this. So the Meeting Place, which is a uh, uh, trade journal for, for the meat industry, which I get, and, and I'm sure many of you do too, just kidding, um, uh, has noticed this, right? And they're saying, look, meat consumption is declining. But what's been interesting about it From here is on that, out, I, I promise, you can our see veggie this. burgers will not just about be bar is, coasters soaked in MSG. dairy has this proliferation. <laughs> well, anyway, it was very funny what he just said. Um, <laughs> so, so dairy has uh, this proliferation of products, right, that have, have come onto the market, soy milk, almond milk, et cetera, and are positioned right next to dairy, to, da to dairy milk, right? That hasn't happened with respect to, to meat, right? There has been no analogous uh, uh, development. What has happened, and what that joke was about, was that there's been a very um, underperforming set of meat alternatives, is what they're called, right? They're buried somewhere far away in the supermarket, uh, they are uh, the result of research and development, but, but not an enormous investment in research and development that's commensurate with the problem that we have with meat consumption, right? And so consumers have rejected them largely. What our goal was, was to create a scientific group of the most talented scientists that we could find from the best universities that we could recruit them from, put them all together, whether they're biophysicists, protein chemists, et cetera, and say, understand meat better than anybody else, and then rebuild it directly from plants. Don't use anything that's GMO. Don't use anything that's artificial. Find the core parts, the core molecules that make meat meat. Find analogous parts within plants, or the same, and build a piece of meat. And so we've been working on this since 2009. And uh, about two weeks ago, we released uh, probably our best product yet, which is a raw burger that can be uh, uh, cooked just like a animal protein equivalent. It's made from pea protein. There's no GMOs in it. There's no soy. There's no wheat. <clears throat> there's nothing artificial. Uh, it transitions from a raw state to a cooked state. Uh, you can come at any time to our facility and see how we make it. There was a, um, there was a, uh, um, a health scare in the poultry industry about two years ago and it was in California, and they had to do a bunch of recalls. And we also make a plant-based chicken. And so during that, we offered the opportunity for any member of the public to come into our facility and see how we make their products, see how we make their food. But we did ask that Purdue do the same. We did ask that the other poultry providers do the same, and none of them could. So a big belief of ours is that not only are we going to create a food that is exactly like the animal protein you've enjoyed for generations. But we're going to be transparent about how we make it. We're going to invite people into our facilities. We are going to create that glass wall that so many people have talked about at the, at the slaughterhouse. It's not only creating the right product, it's placing it in the right place. So about two weeks ago, we launched this product in Whole Foods, and we did it in Boulder, Colorado. The result was phenomenal. People are hungry for this solution. And Victor Hugo said something which is often quoted, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. I'm very blessed to be working on a problem that people feel the time has come for a solution. So we sat in a meat case, 
I, I stood there watching customers buy it. They came back, they looked at the alternatives, they said, I could get bison, I can get grass-fed, I can get normal 80-20, I can get pork, etc. But here I can get a plant-based meat that my children, my husband, my wife, they're going to love. And I can do it, and I can feel better about my purchase, I can feel better about what I'm doing to my body, I can feel better about what I'm doing to the earth, I don't have to deal with the, the, uh, the death of an animal. And it sold out. We uh, packed the inventory in there for a week, we sold it in an hour. And we've been trying to get it back on shelf, and it keeps going through, and people keep buying it, keep buying it, keep buying it. So there is hope in all of this. That's what it looks like uh, after it's been cooked and, and uh, it's being consumed. So Whole Foods, which is an amazing partner, um, I used to work for a, uh, a fuel cell company, and our partners were large automotive companies. And they did everything they could to squeeze price out of what we're doing. Whole Foods, while they're smart business people, have done everything they can to help our business grow. At every step, Whole Foods has helped me get to where we want to go. A guy named Tom Rich, who is the regional vice president in the Rocky Mountain region, he's the reason this happened. He said, I'll put you in the meat case. Let's see what happens. The turns we get in the meat case versus being in the penalty box, being tucked away in something called a meat alternative section, it makes all the difference. So they also put in something called the Beyond Burger Stand, which is a, a branded uh, restaurant in, in their store uh, named, after, named after our company and our products. And that's been a huge success. So we've got a lot of nice coverage uh, over, the, over the launch. Again, I think this just speaks to the fact that this is something that people are interested in, 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 in seeing. Social media, it's been amazing what you can do now today that you couldn't do 10 years ago. We get instant feedback from consumers. Um, and I love putting out products. I put them out every year, and I can even understand there's a consumer like this aspect or, or, or that aspect. And it allows me to get into the living rooms and into the dining rooms of American families and understand what they want and what they don't want. So real quick, one thing I have a lot of passion for. Uh, when I was younger, uh, the Got Milk campaign was a big deal, where they had athletes and celebrities talk about if you fed your children milk, uh, they'd grow big and strong. I drank a ton of milk. Maybe they're right, I'm not sure. I think it's probably genetics. But, um, <laughs> but for tomorrow, it's about plant protein. This generation, when we go talk to universities, the rooms are packed. People are so interested in this because they see this is a system that's not going to work going forward. So the opportunity to go in and talk to young people, and for them, the future of protein is plant-based protein. Why is this important on a global scale? Very quickly. That red line at the top there is China and meat consumption. The red line at the bottom is Africa and meat consumption. So if China continues in that direction, we won't have a climate. If Africa, which they should, right, starts to gain affluence and, and starts to consume meat at the same uh, rate, we also will not have a climate. So we should not export the animal protein model. We should ex export a model that allows people to continue to eat what they love, which is meat, but eat it as meat made from plants. Thanks. Ethan, tell us something about your level of production now. How much of this stuff can you produce? Right. And is any of it available in Canada? Right. Uh, so it's, we have a, a pilot facility for this fresh, what we call fresh beef. Uh, in, in August, uh, we should have a, a much larger uh, production process in place. So right now, it's pretty constrained. Um, we will be coming into Canada most likely next year. I have, a, I have a big interest in doing that. My father is a professor at McGill huh? and lives in Montreal. So I went so, to McGill. See, I'm going there right now. All right. Great. So next year, will you come back with a pile of burgers for us? Yes. Yeah. Beast Burgers <laughs> at Idea City. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.